Hello, everyone. Good morning. How's it going? I guess it's 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 almost uh, it's almost noon now. It's almost lunch. I should mention, by the way, uh, before I forget, uh, not only did I make a pretty robust resources page for today's presentation at at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash ahs18. But because admittedly, as you guys already know, people are just like flying through these presentations because we don't have a lot of time. I'm boogieing right afterwards over into the next room and I've got my book over there, which is like 500 plus pages jam packed with more information for if you want something to put you to sleep at night. And I'll go out there and, and I'll answer more questions and sign books and we can just, just chat for those of you who are, who are uh, on a three to five day water fasting protocol and decide you're gonna skip lunch because I know we're all into that around here. Uh, part two, why part two of biohacking versus ancestral living? Well, uh, first of all, I should grab this mic out so I can go into rapper mode and hold it upside down like the rappers do. Um, a couple of years ago, I guess two or three years ago, I presented at AHS and uh, people seem to dig this concept of taking a lot of these expensive biohacks and figuring out ways that we can filter them and decide what's going to be ancestral and natural versus what could potentially, uh, you know, screw us or be a waste of time and money. Uh, and I thought I'd come back. And since it's been a couple of years and all sorts of new things have hit the streets, I would talk to you a little bit about what's working and kind of moving the dial for me and also some, some ways that we can naturally tap into some of those things without necessarily, you know, spending $10,000 on a butt plug that delivers synthetic LSD and monitors your heart rate variability. So, uh, so ultimately, uh, let's let's get into that quick quick thing. I, I got into all this when I was in college. I was a bodybuilder and and was into like putting huge slabs of muscle on my body and and decreasing body fat. And that that was how I really got into this in the first place. Was a full on bro science exploration of what kind of nutrition, fitness tactics, and supplements really move the dial from an aesthetics and a, a pure fitness standpoint. After that, I got into uh, the next unhealthiest sport on the face of the planet, chronic cardio and endurance, and uh, did that for about 10 years, and that, uh, that is still, to a certain extent, what I'm involved in, although I've kind of dialed things back, uh, frankly, based on, on measurements of everything from inflammation to uh, glycemic variability to telomere length and you know the discovery that, that a lot of this, uh, this fitnessing isn't necessarily good for one, and so now I now I compete in, in more of the short and intense type of events. And to be honest, uh, my, my chronic cardio now is training for bow hunting and spear fishing. And even though in many cases, you know, on a typical hunt, you're out there for, for five or six days engaged in, in low level physical activity the entire day, it's, it's far different than say, hammering on a bike during an Ironman for 10 hours and it feels more natural and it's, it's of course very functional too. And if you, uh, if you yourself are interested in, I would say some of the more ancestral forms of fitness, getting a bow and learning how to hunt and track and smell and sense the wind and go out there for long periods of time or uh, grabbing, a, grabbing a spear gun and going down to a place like Fort Lauderdale and taking a, taking a free diving course in my opinion, those are two of the best ways to maintain fitness in a very ancestral way. And you know, those are two things I'm, I'm teaching my kids to do so that they, when they grow up, can scratch that, that climb your own personal Mount Everest ditch without necessarily you know, writing a $1,000 check to, to the Ironman Triathlon Corporation. So uh, ultimately, th this is my family. My wife, uh, she's a homemaker. And we, uh, we live kind of off grid over in Spokane. And we raise goats and chickens. and. Uh, I hunt most of our meat, and she grows most of our food at a, in a bunch of raised vegetable gardens over there. And my, my children, my, my twin boys, they, uh, they also are, are very into this concept of living as ancestrally as possible. But at the same time, you know, I, I, I also am not opposed to the idea of a lot of these modern biohacks. I like to live life through the lens of kind of having one foot planted in the realm of ancestral living and the other in the realm of, of modern biohacking. And if you go and visit our home in the forest, there, there certainly are a lot, of, uh, a lot of things outside that would think, make, make you think we're you know, dirty hippies living out in the middle of the forest, you know, and, you know, the, the garden and, and the animals and everything else. But inside, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of all these biohacks that I experiment with and test and use myself as an N equals one for and research and figure out what works and what doesn't. And that's kind of, that's kind of how I live my life. So 
ultimately, I am not opposed to many of these things that we would consider to be better living through science, such as, say, utilizing near and far infrared in my office when I'm writing and I'm hunched over a computer and I can't be outside like my wife pushing around a wheelbarrow, so I'm inside using near and far infrared lights instead of sunlight and taking stops to, to hoist a, a hex bar uh, for deadlifting instead of you know working and lifting rocks out in the sun and, and that's a way that I can almost biohack or simulate a little bit more of a, of a natural life and that's that's how some of these biohacks actually work. Uh, my company by the way is, is Keon. I've gotten lots of questions about this and, and what it means but in a nutshell the, the three swoops are they stand for mind, body, and spirit optimization. And that's actually what the new book that I'm working on is about, is not just enhancing one's body, which my last book was about, and a certain amount of brain biohacking, but also spirituality, longevity, purpose, happiness, and even some of these woo-woo concepts such as energy medicine and quantum physics and Bruce Lipton's teaching on you know the biology of belief and sound healing and some of these things that might be considered to be a bit more fringe but that do have some, some interesting research and of course a little bit of, of uh, ancestral practice behind them. So uh, I left off my last talk at AHS talking about Thomas Thwaites, the goat man. Is anybody familiar with the, with the goat man who turned himself into a goat using prosthetic limbs uh, for, for a period of time to live out with the goats and see what it would be like to use a, a bit of biohacking to uh, to be one with nature and, and to live in an ancestry with the goats. And uh, it didn't work out quite so well for him in most scenarios. He had a little bit of trouble uh, with his prosthetics and his, his giant aerodynamic helmet there. But uh, he's actually, he's, he's turned into filmmaking now, his, his new projects, and I'll, I'll link to them on the resources webpage for this presentation. They're actually quite interesting. He's now engaged in a project to uh, to, to show what virtual reality will be like you know, decades from now and the advances that are taking place in virtual reality and AI. So he's kind of taken a deep dive into that sector. But ultimately, Thomas Thwaites, the goat man, if you haven't had a chance to pick up his book or, uh, or look into what he did to himself and you're interested in, in merging biohacking and ancestral living uh, in a very comical manner, he's, he's a good guy to follow. So ultimately, you know, many of these modern biohacks that we see folks engaged in, uh, I think that are caveman ancestors, to be incredibly stereotypical with this blog post of the, or this, uh, this image of a man and his, his leopard unitard running from a saber-toothed tiger, uh, which is the way that I imagine life was thousands of years ago everywhere, right? Uh, there, are, there are certain things we have now that they would have used, like this. This is, a, this is an implantable compass. This, is, this would be considered a biohack that will vibrate every time that you're facing magnetic north, and it's also accompanied by two additional sensors that will allow you to uh, to sense uh, via inputs what's going on behind you, almost like eyes in the back of your head. It will vibrate based on certain audio and visual cues. And I, I could see some amount of efficacy in something like that. And, and there is, of course, this fact that uh, wayfinding, right, knowing how to use the wind, which a lot of, I know someone just presented on ketosis, and, and the fact that, that a lot of Inuits will, will live in that state, but they also, place a great deal of emphasis on using the wind to wayfind. We saw Polynesian navigators using the moon and the stars, of course, and there are a variety of ways that you can teach yourself how to navigate, but at the same time, this idea of using an internal built-in compass is something I'm not opposed to the idea of. There are other things like, like night vision. You know, We know that kale and carrots and eggs and sources of, of lutein and zeaxanthin are certainly great for our eye health, but uh, you know, this gentleman actually had chlorella uh, injected into his eyeballs to be able to see at night. Uh, the effects are not permanent. They lasted for a few days, but they actually enhanced him with night vision, and that's something that I would have imagined that a, that a hunter or, or an early human predator would have actually found a little bit of, of efficacy with. Uh, this gentleman actually had an antenna installed uh, into the uh, occipital bone in the back of his head. I'm sure he used more than just like a, a common set of wood screws, but ultimately that antenna, because he is colorblind, allows him to 
to see or to feel colors. There are certain cues that are presented to him via that antenna when he's presented with blue or red or purple. And so this is another example of, of, a, of a biohack. You can see that a lot of these involve a lot more than, say, uh, putting, putting butter into your coffee. I mean, in my opinion, this is, this is true biohacking. And they actually, the, the, the way that they refer to this, and there's an entire book about this called Grinders, is the human body is the wetware. And then hardware is placed onto the human body. And, and that, in my opinion, is truly hacking, hacking human biology. Uh, these, are, these are chips now, implantable chips underneath the skin. I believe Peter Diamandis has one of these. A, a few other folks are now implanting these. Currently, they will track things like glucose, uh, lactate, ATP levels, a lot of these things that we currently wear devices that, that emit signals to track. Ultimately, a lot of folks are, are installing these underneath the skin as a way to, to track parameters. And this is another fascinating and emerging technology uh, that's, that's very similar to this idea of, of just having an entire lab on a chip and planted underneath your skin. And I can see some efficacy in that too. I've actually gotten a great deal of health insights by using a continuous blood glucose monitor, which this is essentially the, the fancy, minimal, dialed down equivalent of that. Uh, there are other technologies that are interesting. This is an RFID chip that folks are now installing uh, underneath their skin to enable them to be able to log into their computer, get into their car, get into their home. It's essentially like a, like a security device that allows uh, certain other devices that you interact with to be able to identify you. Uh, there are certain things that I don't think would have been found too useful for our, for our ancestors. This, for example, is a camera now that a lot of these, these grinders are installing into their eyes. It allows you to make your entire life into a movie. It's literally an entire video camera setup that's installed in the orbital section, and it allows you to just track everything that goes on in your life. And it's kind of like a, like a smartphone in selfie mode on steroids. Uh, this also, I'm, I'm not quite sure that I see a great deal of usefulness for this, unless you're Tom Cruise in, the, in that Minority Report movie, but folks are now, and, and this, is, this is a hand that has actual uh, magnetic implants installed in the hand to allow a user to be able to interact with devices such as touch screens to be able to, to pick up small objects, because apparently you can't do that unless you have magnets installed in your fingertips. But that's, that's another example of, of a modern biohack. These, uh, the, these uh, fancy bioluminescent uh, tattoos that folks are installing underneath their skin, uh, th there's, uh, does anyone know why someone would do something like this? Bioluminescent tattoos under the skin? The actual functional efficacy of that? Well, there isn't one. They're just supposed to look cool. These are, these are just tattoos. There's, there's absolutely no, no usefulness for this aside from that they look cool or might be used kind of like that new movie uh, Black Panther is, is like an identification method for your tribe. This gentleman actually had uh, uh, stereo speakers installed in his ears. Sorry for the, for the gory graphic, but this actually allows him to enhance his, his hearing. And I, I could see some amount of efficacy in that, you know, just, just in, in terms of like, you know, hunting to be able to, to hear the sheep 500 yards away instead of 100 yards away. But this is another example of a modern biohack and a way that people are trying to upgrade their biology. Uh, and then there are these, these uh, large devices that folks are now installing in their forearms. There's a, there's a group of grinders now doing this. Uh, and it, it's a very uh, unwieldy and, and uh, in my opinion, somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, disruptive piece of technology to have installed underneath one's skin. But this can actually track your, at this point, your body temperature, which again to me seems a little bit silly to, to do that versus say, <laughs> Buying a, buying a little thermometer that you could put underneath your tongue, or you know, I, I wear a ring that tracks body temperature, but ultimately folks are doing this as well. Uh, and then of course there, there's the ultimate biohack, what I like to call birth control for your head. Uh, these, these blue light blocking glasses. <laughs> and uh, no, I, I just, I don't consider that to be a biohack, but I certainly do, uh, I certainly do use those myself. And it, this, this is kind of the transition that we'll make into some of these things that don't necessarily involve surgery, but that are installed. But you know, things that, things that you can purchase or do to yourself that are a little bit less permanent than, uh, than uh, say, uh, you know, uh, having something installed into your earlobes. But one here is, is very interesting. Uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Uh, there's some evidence that your NAD to NADH ratios can directly influence your rate of aging. 
uh, your level of inflammation, uh, and a host of factors related primarily to longevity and overall wellness. And there is an emerging trend of folks either doing injections or IVs of NAD. A close corollary to that is a supplement that's very popular nowadays called NR, nicotinamide riboside, which is a form of vitamin B3, which also appears to be pretty efficacious. And it, it is certainly something that I use, and in my own telomere tracking have found that the use of NAD, along with something else I'll allude to on this presentation, uh, stem cell therapy, has a profound effect in decreasing the rate at which telomeres shorten. Now at the same time, these injections are expensive. You're going to spend uh, close to $1,000 to go into a medical clinic and have something like this done. And in many cases, the, the standard protocol is you go in for NAD IVs for four days in a row, sometimes up to 10 days, and then maintain those levels with supplementations or th with repeat injections. I personally have an IV sent to my house and administer it once per week via uh, a push IV. But in fact, when it comes to more ancestral methods of adjusting your NAD to NADH ratios, well, one of the best ways to do it is via fasting. It turns out that uh, a lot of these things that are mildly uncomfortable, a lot of these hormetic stressors are not only fantastic for increasing your own endogenous stem cell production and availability, but also for increasing your NAD to NADH ratios. It's not caloric restriction that seems to move the dial in this sense. It's simply longer periods of time spent between meals. So many people begin to live their entire lives cold and libido-less and you know, craving whatever, a bowl of, of gnocchi with, with mushrooms or a big old ribeye steak because they're simply starved the whole time. The idea is you go a long period of time without eating. And I, I have some friends who implement intermittent fasting and they simply have an enormous 2,500 to 3,000 calorie dinner at evening each night and that's their single meal of the day. Uh, I, as I, as I kind of progress through life and get a little bit farther and farther away from the extreme exercise protocols, am getting closer to a two-day a meal protocol, uh, along with the 12 to 16 hour intermittent fast daily, uh, some type of a coffee or, or you know, something with some nutrients added into it, like a mushroom tea for breakfast, and then uh, a big salad for lunch and a large dinner, and then a 24 hour dinner time to dinner time fast each week. And I've found in tracking my inflammation and my glycemic variability and also my telomere length that this has also been effective. So just this concept of intermittent fasting with the idea that it doesn't necessarily have to involve calorie restriction so much as long periods of time spent between meals, especially if your goal for intermittent fasting is longevity more than it is for, for weight loss. Another example is this, beta-lapachines. Beta-lapachines uh, are found in a type of tea called Paudiarco bark tea. Paudiarco bark tea, which you can actually purchase on Amazon, and, and this is actually a precursor to NAD. So this would be another example of something you could make at home without doing these type of injections. It's very simple and kind of a low cost way to get some of these same effects. A sauna, frequent sauna exposure and frequent heat exposure as a hormetic stressor to increase your NAD levels also can help out with your stem cell production. So this is another one that seems to be pretty efficacious, not only for performance and detoxification through your skin's largest or through your, your body's largest detoxification organ, your skin, but it's also quite useful as a, as a way to increase your NAD levels. Fermented foods. Fermented foods can also increase NAD, so eating a large variety of fermented foods, especially in light of the fact that very few of these probiotic supplements that are sold to us have been shown in research to actually be able to seed the stomach properly or stick around for a very long period of time. This, this is a very efficacious way via kimchi and sauerkraut and dairy and kefir and a lot of these other ferments to be able to increase NAD levels as well. A lot of people aren't aware of the NAD to NADH ratio adjustment with fermented foods. Raw honey is another. Interestingly, this is one that I recently discovered is something that can increase your NAD, NADH ratio. So the use of raw honey, for example, a little bit before bedtime for a slow release of energy or a little bit with like, you know, for example, I have a carrot every day with lunch and I put a little bit of raw honey on the carrot. I'm weird like that. I have these, these strange habits and I ate a carrot every lunch, one big old raw carrot with some raw honey on it. Uh, high intensity interval training uh, in moderation, more than 60 minutes per day actually appears to be associated with increased risk of mortality, but shorter sessions, you know, shorter 15 to 30 minute high intensity interval training sessions also can improve your NAD to NADH ratios. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy or uh, intermittent hypoxic training, meaning 
using devices. This is one that I have in my office called a Live O2, a Live O2. It allows me to flip between hyperoxia and hypoxia while doing something like a high intensity interval training session uh, with my bicycle set next to this. Now hyperbaric oxygen has been shown to have a lot of benefits, especially when it comes to moving the dial for things like uh, mitochondrial density or erythropoietin production. Uh, it also has, of course, a lot of research behind it when it comes to things like Alzheimer's and dementia and improved blood flow to the brain. Uh, the idea is, though, however, if you don't want to purchase a very expensive device like this, a couple other things that, that can act similarly. You know, on my walk up here this morning, I do this a lot when I'm walking, I was practicing a, a style of breathing uh, called buteco breathing. Buteco breathing is based on this concept that a lot of people spend their lives engaged in a state of chronic hyperventilation, meaning that we blow off a lot of CO2. And as a matter of fact, CO2 or carbon dioxide is often vilified as being something that creates a state of metabolic acidosis. But in fact, by maintaining high levels of CO2, along with high levels of oxygen simultaneously, there's something called the Bohr's equation in exercise physiology, which means that when you have high levels of CO2, oxygen is more readily dissociated from red blood cells and deposited into your tissues. And learning how to engage in this buteco breathing, I have a very small inexpensive device called a relaxator that if you would have seen me walking up here this morning from my motel, I was breathing in and out of. And all it does is it allows me to breathe through my nose and then limit the flow of oxygen out of my mouth so that I'm releasing CO2 very slowly. The same can be done by breathing in through your nose, then breathing out very slowly through pursed lips with the goal of your daily respiration rate eventually getting down to about 10 to 12 breaths per minute with some retention of CO2. Very, very good way to tap into the, some of the benefits of hyperbaric oxygen therapy without actually buying a big chamber or using one of these devices. Uh, there's also this, uh, this idea of the, the young Spartans in training, the Cryptea, and I'll use this concept as well. My children do this also with me, is we'll put a shot of water or a handful of rocks into the mouth and then try to walk or jog X amount of distance while only breathing through our nose. This concept of training yourself to breathe nasally, which increases oxygen and does a great job filtering and warming the air that you breathe, during exercise or doing movement is also a great way to simulate some of these hypoxic benefits that we get via something like hyperbaric while also retaining a lot of carbon dioxide. These are simple methods that we can use, just basic breathwork concepts. Um, another popular thing of late has been these exogenous ketones. Exogenous ketones are, you know, they're, they're something that, uh, that are available now for $30 to $40 for what would be called a ketone ester as well as less expensive for, for the slightly less efficacious, but still a good way to amp up ketones, these ketone salts. So many of them are, are for sale now, and a lot of them, them taste good. I, you know, I've been using things like this for about eight years, and they used to taste horribly, and now a lot of them taste like freaking crack cocaine. They're, they're pretty good, actually. Um, but, uh, of course, we know that things like cold and fasting can also, uh, can also do a, a very, very good job at putting you into a state of ketosis in a little bit more natural way. I mean, that's really how our ancestors would have traditionally gotten to a state of ketosis, would not have been by consuming perfect keto salted caramel collagen, but instead <laughs> by actually uh, going for long periods of time without eating. Now, something that was recently, recently brought to my attention when I was having a conversation with Dominique Diagostino, who's one of the world's foremost ketone researchers, organ meats, and specifically liver, are natural storehouses of beta-hydroxybutyrate, which are actually these same salts and esters that we're purchasing in these expensive ketone supplements. And this even uh, causes me to, to raise an eyebrow at this idea that a lot of people will say, well, ancient man never would have had elevated levels of glucose and elevated levels of ketones as we're able to achieve now by being able to have a meal and then wash it down with some ketone esters to push ourselves into a state of ketosis. Well, it turns out if you're having a, a big old meal of, of meat after you've, say, had a kill or you're, you're out at your fancy farm to table restaurant eating liver, you actually are elevating your ketones simultaneous to elevating your blood glucose or increasing your glycogen availability. So I think that being in a state of ketosis, even when food is present, is something that our ancestors would have would have been in, especially if they were eating a high intake of organ meats. So this is another thing, fasting the intake of organ meats and some amount of cold as a way to simulate some of the effects of these exogenous ketones. 
Another thing, of course, that's very popular of date are these nootropics or smart drugs. I just finished about a 6,000 word article that'll be published Tuesday on my website about how to source psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin and how to supplement with things like, uh, you know, things like uh, nootropics and smart drugs and kind of an analysis of a lot of these different things that are on the market. But ultimately, there are natural ways to tap into this as well. Uh, my sons, just about six days ago, went out on our land and they harvested a bunch of St. John's wort, which actually acts very, very similar to an SSRI and acts on serotonin receptors very similarly to a lot of these nootropics. And they, they took a bunch of vodka, they, they mix the vodka into a jar, they go into the pantry every day and they shake it, and within four weeks we'll have a tincture of St. John's wort that acts to pick the mood up in a very similar way as like a lot of these supplements that include macuna or L-dopa or some of these things that increase dopamine while making more serotonin available. So this would be an example of a, of a natural nootropic that uh, has been used for thousands of years, St. John's warts. They call it the, the happy flower. Uh, lion's mane, I think this one's cool because it actually looks like a bunch of little axons and dendrites. This for sparking neurogenesis and sprouting new neurons is actually a fantastic supplement and can be found in many cases for, for pennies on the dollar compared to these $150 bottles of, of smart drugs and supplements that we can purchase. And lion's mane is something that I use almost daily now and part of this is based on genetic testing that I've done uh, that shows both myself and my children have lower than normal levels of BDNF production. So I choose my supplements very carefully based on my genetics and personal needs, but lion's mane is something both myself and my, my twin 10-year-old boys use on a regular basis. So lion's mane would be another natural nootropic that would be a little bit more of an ancestral approach. Psilocybin, you know, a lot of these studies at Johns Hopkins University, for example, have been shown that it as well is fantastic for neurogenesis. Uh, and about once a week, I'll use about a half gram of psilocybin, about 0 0.5 grams, and blend this with lion's mane for even more enhanced neurogenesis, and then anything that increases blood flow, niacin, or even that, that nicotinamide riboside supplement or any NAD precursor, like I referred to earlier, this is a very, very potent stat for increasing the health of your brain, and it works very well. I've been doing this uh, every Sunday for about eight to 10 weeks now, and it's a very, very potent stack for neurogenesis. Psilocybin, along with lion's mane, along with, with anything, you know, even beetroot that increases blood flow. Uh, finally, green tea would be another that I really like. You'll find caffeine and L-theanine combined in many of these supplements. And, and this, again, is very, very easy to find in its natural form in green tea. And this is a fantastic natural nootropic, especially with my own testing post-noon to allow you to get a cognitive edge without decreasing your percentage of deep sleep, particularly. So these are examples of natural nootropics that you can have around your house. Stem cells, uh, a few months ago, I, I became one of the first people in the world to undergo a full body stem cell makeover, meaning I went under anesthesia and had every joint in my body injected with stem cells. I went under cosmetic and sexual enhancement with stem cell treatments and basically based on the stem cell theory of aging that your natural uh, endogenous availability of stem cells will tend to decrease as you age and this can affect longevity. You're refilling those stores. Well, this is an expensive procedure. We're talking about a twenty-five to thirty thousand dollar procedure to actually have a full body stem cell done, and anywhere in the range of three thousand to eight thousand to go and have your stem cells extracted from your fat or your bone and stored for reinjections later uh, as as an anti aging protocol. There are things that can improve your endogenous availability of stem cells. One would be marine phytoplankton, which is available somewhat inexpensively, especially relative to stem cells, as a supplement that can be used for stem cell production endogenously. Aloe vera is another. Aloe vera juice or aloe vera extract seems to have an impact on what's called totipotent stem cell availability. Uh, eating small baby goats also. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, colostrum. Colostrum. Which, uh, which is, is found in the, in the milk given, given to, to young mammals. Colostrum is also a great supplement for increasing stem cell availability. I don't use it year round because it can cause a steep rise in insulin-like growth factor and insulin, which can be uh, correlated to, to an increase in mTOR, uh, which could cause accelerated aging. But at certain times during the year, I'll use colostrum. I'll load with that for about four to eight weeks and then come off it for about four to eight weeks. So the use of colostrum is also uh, a, a good one. Chlorella is another. Chlorella tablets are something I actually travel with and use quite a bit. Uh, curcumin is another, the extract of, of turmeric. 
Uh, coffee berry fruit extract. This is an interesting one, uh, but one that has some very interesting research behind it, again, on increasing stem cell availability. And this can be purchased in powder form on Amazon and added to things like smoothies and shakes. And many of these ingredients that I'm showing you, you can easily combine all of these. You know, uh, Eric here and sitting in the front row has been on my podcast and talked about his 30 ingredient smoothie. And I'm well known for making elaborate smoothies and shakes with a lot of different ingredients in them. And one that I'll make quite frequently is I'll just grab a lot of these things that I have in my pantry and make myself what I call a, a stem cell shake with a lot of these different ingredients that allow you to tap into some of these benefits of stem cell production without necessarily forking over 3000 to 8000 to $30,000. Instead, you're just spending, I don't know, I guess $50 on expensive coffee berry fruit extract on Amazon, but it's all relative. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, this one is, uh, uh, I'm forget. I, I believe that's Moringa. Moringa is, is another that you'll find uh, as, a, as a stem cell precursor. Uh, anything that would be considered a sirtuin enhancing food, blueberries, dark chocolate, red wine, resveratrol, not only do these improve your NAD to NADH ratios, but they can have an impact on your stem cells as well. The purples, the blues, the very, very darkly colored supplements and, and nutrients that we find in nature, these would be other things that you should include in your diet on a regular basis. Uh, I personally will save most fructose that I'll take in until towards the end of the day when my, uh, when my liver glycogen stores are a little bit empty because fructose can, before it spills over into triglycerides, get converted into liver glycogen. Your muscles can't take it up. But if you're, if you're eating a lot of these fructose-rich suturin sources on an empty stomach or in a fasted state, they can actually do a good job without causing too much triglyceride or, or too much fructose. Um, this is uh, cacao. Cacao fruit is also a great one. Uh, the uh, cacao nibs are a staple in my diet. I'm also a big fan of the, uh, the cacao fruit. So uh, air filtering. You know, there are expensive air filters like this. I keep one in my office called a molecule. It's about 10 times more sensitive than a HEPA air filter. Uh, but there's also this NASA houseplant study, and we've installed a lot of these plants around our house. I'll include a link to it on the resources page for this presentation. Uh, everything from peace lily to English ivy to a lot of these plants that naturally clean up the air, that act as a natural detoxifant, that release a little bit of negative ions, that even release some of their essential oils that can help to decrease cortisol. There's a lot of, of compounded benefits to having a wide variety of plants around your house, and they can act very, very similarly to these filters. If you want a little bit more of an, an ancestral way to you know, not spend a bunch of money on, on a molecule HEPA air filter. Hydrogen-rich water is another very, very uh, popular kind of water source as, as a selective anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. A lot of research coming out of Japan right now on hydrogen-rich water along with structured water, which structures water and allows water to maintain the natural state that it would have been in uh, based on a lot of Gerald Pollack's research at the University of Washington, which allows it to flow more easily through the body and also be absorbed better into the cells. Uh, the idea being that when water is structured, it creates what's called an exclusion zone, which is an electrochemical gradient that allows water to move more readily through vessels. Uh, there is also, though, a, a tribe, uh, I believe they're, they're close to um, uh, the, the, the Hunza tribe. They create this stuff called Hunza water. Uh, they're, they're somewhere close to, to uh, Kili, I believe, Kilimanjaro. I don't know the exact location, but, but what they do is they have water that's very mineral rich and that gets a lot of sunlight added to it. And not only can you get an increased structuring of water, but an increased hydrogen ion availability when you use this tactic to make water at home. The way that you do it, it's very simple. We do this at home with glass carboys. You can just buy glass carboys at Amazon or at your local hardware store. You fill them with big chunks of like a Himalayan salt. And, and there's actually a form called Sole salt that you can purchase. And then you fill that with water and you place it out in sunlight. Now the water will get very salty. Do not make the mistake of drinking the water by the cup full because you will, you'll develop uh, explosive diarrhea the rest of the day, trust me. And N equals one, been there, done that. But getting a shot glass of this stuff and putting it into your regular glass of water actually allows you to get most of the benefits of hydrogen rich water and structured water without buying all these expensive water generators or water machines. Yeah, there's a little bit of extra labor involved, but it's a very, very simple tactic and it's simply salt and sunlight that you're using to create the same chemical effect as a lot of these expensive machines and filters are using. 
Plus, it just feels a little bit more hippie and natural. Uh, a couple others. Uh, antibiotics, uh, of course, are popular. And, and you know, I just thought it would be fun to mention the, the medieval literature that's been unearthed of late that show that the use of things like garlic and allium and onions and leeks can all have a significant impact on things like methicillin-resistant uh, bacteria. And a lot of these things that we normally take antibiotics for, well, there's, and I'll, I'll link to the, to the cookbook, the medieval cookbook, on the resources page for this, but there, there's an entire cookbook full of medieval lore that actually has a lot of these things that have now been tested in research and shown to be effective against antibiotic resistant bacteria that you can use in the medicine cabinet of your home. You know, and I have smoothies that I make out of garlic and leek and onions and they taste like ass. But when you consume them, uh, when, you, when, you're in, when, when your immune system is compromised, they're actually a fantastic way to, to use a more ancestral approach than modern pharmaceuticals. Uh, metformin is very popular of late, even in the anti-aging and longevity sectors, along with, of, of course, the use of insulin pumps in, in people who, who have diabetic complications. But uh, the elephant in the room, in my opinion, is the idea that we can control glycemic variability, which is, in my opinion, in addition to inflammation, one of the best things to track when it comes to your longevity via natural methods. Uh, drinking copious amounts of alcohol, for example. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Using bitters and digestifs. I commonly will have a bitter or a digestif infused cocktail prior to dinner because it enhances my first phase insulin response to a meal. It enhances your body's ability to naturally release insulin and lower blood glucose. So there's something to be said for the Moscow mule with the ginger and the mint and the lime in it, which acts as a natural digestif or bitter to enhance your blood glucose response to a meal. Ceylon cinnamon is another. Vastly improves insulin sensitivity at a dose of about two teaspoons a day. Anything bitter, bitter melon extract is a supplement that I use regularly. It's one of the daily supplements that I use if I'm going to eat a carbohydrate rich meal because based on my own testing with a continuous blood glucose monitor, it lowers my glucose better than metformin, meaning that, that when I take that prior to a meal, I take about three to four capsules now before I eat a carbohydrate rich meal, it decreases blood glucose. When you wrote stop, is that for Q&A or overall? Done, done. Okay, we'll keep going. I'll do Q and I'll do Q and A over at my table. Uh, berberine is another. Berberine is a great extract for blood sugar control. Apple cider vinegar, a shot of this added to that digestive for bitter rich cocktail that you would have. This also fantastic for blood glucose control. Chewing. Chewing food anywhere from 25 to 40 times per bite actually improves your insulin response to a meal. So this would be another thing that you can do instead of taking some of these expensive, you know, biohack type of supplements for decreasing blood sugar. Uh, cryotherapy is also popular of late, and of course, I will address another elephant in the room, the fact that rather than forking over 70 to $80 to visit a cryotherapy chamber, you can take a cold shower or, better yet, a cold soak, with the advantage being when your head gets wet, you get a vagus nerve activation that gives you a better response to cold than you do when you're in one of these cryotherapy chambers where you got to keep your, your head above the chamber. Now, granted, you do that so that you don't die, but at the same time, <laughs> Getting underwater and taking a cold shower, in my opinion, beats the pants off of forking out over a bunch of money for these, these cryotherapy chambers, as long as you don't mind getting wet and having to put your makeup back on, which you don't have to do with, with cryotherapy. Uh, sunlight, or, or, or infrared light, rather. You know, I'm, I'm well known for using all these crazy light biohacks, like you know, uh, uh, this, this one for circadian rhythm, or the light in the, in the, uh, in the ears as well, the human charger. Uh, as well as this Violite, which is basically photobiomodulation for the head, originally developed for Alzheimer's and dementia, but it actually works fantastically for decreasing inflammation in neural tissue, especially after I've been traveling or I'm jet lagged, et cetera. Well, of course, you know, the, the glaringly obvious fact is that we can, of course, get a lot of this from sunlight, uh, near and far infrared, as well as UVA and UVB. And I realize it's kind of like a, a simple and stupid answer, but if, if you're purchasing all these biohacks and you're not actually getting out into the sunlight every day, then in my opinion, you're, you're, you're wasting your money on the biohacks if you haven't yet tapped into the sun. A lot of these things that seem sexy and that we pay a lot of money for can be simulated with the, with the way that our ancestors would have got it. And if I have the choice between putting in a human charger and wearing the retimer glasses or going out and standing in the sunlight, I choose the latter. So I go natural whenever I can, even though I know there's a lot of silly photos of me on the internet with these strange things attached to my head. You know, the compass thing, I kind of already kicked that horse to death, some of the alternatives and, you know, the fact that, that folks like the Inuits will use, you know, for example, wind. And I actually found a great article on natural wayfinding and what a lot of ancient cultures did and taught their children. I don't have time to get 
into it right now, but I linked to it on the resources page for this chapter. If you kind of want to take a deep dive, it's a fascinating document on navigation. Finally, uh, there is a book called Grinders, which uh, if you're into this whole wetware, hardware type of thing is good. This is not the actual book Grinders. It's, it's the wrong photo. The book is titled Grinders, but this is a different book called Grinders. So uh, the book Grinders, though, is fascinating. If you want to look at that, I'll link to the actual book on the resources page. And ultimately, you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, um, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to many of these biohacks. I just think that we have to have one foot planted in the realm of ancestral living, the other foot planted in the realm of being open to better living through science and being open to biohacking. But we need to look through at this through the lens of, of what would be considered something natural or something our bodies might naturally produce and what might be considered unnatural in the equivalent of, you know, ripping open your forearm to install a temperature gauge. So I know I flew through the, a lot of this stuff uh, pretty quickly. Oh, my last tip for you is if all else fails, put a stick of butter in your coffee. Um, <laughs> because we know that that's the, the, ultimate, the ultimate biohack. Uh, anyways, though, so I'll, I'll literally just kind of walk out of this room because I know we're trying, trying to end this and you're doing a good job. So yeah. Else yes. So. I'm going into the next room right now. I will answer your questions. I'll be there at my book table with some books available. And uh, I'll just have a Q&A right out there if you want to come on over. So thank you guys.